So as it, as it says on the first slide, and as Jason mentioned, I'm the wildlife program lead for Idaho BLM. Um, I've been with BLM the majority of my, I've been with federal, uh, federal government for close to 35 years, including a hitch in the military. Um, fresh out of college, I worked on one of BLM's, well, actually BLM's first vegetation monitoring sort of effort. It was called the SVIM, or Soil and Vegetation Inventory Method, on a crew in Wyoming for the summer in like 1979. Um, there were a couple, three years there where BLM did a lot of that sort of inventory. Um, and if you're any, if you've been following, if you've been reading anything about natural resource policy in, in any of your studies, the Federal Land Policy Management Act came about in 1976, and so BLM was just gearing up for uh, this whole land use planning, land use management, multiple use thing that uh, uh, kicked off in 1976, even though BLM had been around for a couple decades before that. So I spent a few years in the field uh, as a range, well, a season as a range technician, a couple of years as a wildlife technician, and I fought fire on a helitack crew one summer, did a hitch in the Air Force, and then went to grad school. So I, I kind of went to grad school later on in my, I guess, uh, education. And uh, so, um, and that led to involvement in this sage rose habitat assessment framework that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about today. I'm not going to get into the the field methods, the line point intercept or anything like that. I think you guys get plenty of that. But I want to, as Jason said, we're going to talk about how the sausage is made. And what I want to talk about is sort of some of the challenges I faced as a new biologist and, um, and how policy or lack thereof and state-of-the-art science and emerging science and changes in federal regulations all sort of all started coming together at different times that sort of led to the development of the HAB. Um, so we like to think of the, the HAB as a uh, habitat assessment framework as a, um, a workflow process that we use to evaluate sage grouse habitat at multiple scales. Um, as you may have heard, sage grouse are is a, is a landscape scale species. They use you know, enormous tens of thousands of acres of uh, habitat, sagebrush habitat for their uh, year-long needs, habitat needs. Some populations are migratory, so they, they might move 50 miles to winter habitat. And, and, um, so they cover broad scales. There's also, we'll get, we'll get more into that later. The half also, uh, in particular, promotes a consistency and approach of evaluating habitat. With, with BLM as a federal agency, we have, you know, sage grouse in 11 western states, and so we, we wanted to develop something that, you know, where each office is developing its own monitoring process, we wanted something more consistent, um, uh, including the use of a consistent set of, consistent suite of habitat indicators. Um, and the HAP is also a, a means of facilitating data, data management and um, organization and analysis. And then um, at the end of the day, it allows for a concise summary of our findings at those various scales. Um, I don't know how much you folks know about, is anyone like really well-versed in sage grouse here? I'm just curious. So I'll do a little bit of sage grouse 101 here. That's why Alex raised his hand. So and then we'll get into more detail as we go, but uh, sage grouse is a large upland game bird, kind of like the size of a small turkey. The uh, males might be four, five, seven pounds. Um, females a little bit smaller. They're endemic to the native to the, uh, the Western US and Canada, but they're limited to sagebrush systems. They're, so they're a sagebrush obligate species, meaning you know they can't they can't exist without sagebrush. They're entirely dependent on it. Um, they're also uh, somewhat of a wilderness species in the sense that they don't adapt well to human disturbance like development and uh, energy development and things of that nature. Uh, nesting habitat is, uh, you know, occurs in the spring, May and June, and it's pretty much limited to sagebrush and, and other related shrub cover like bitterbrush, um, along with herbaceous cover that provides concealment for the nest. Uh, forbs are important for uh, foraging hens, 
for their nutrition as well as for the early uh, early broods. Insects are also critically important for the chicks. Summer, they still need sagebrush for cover, but they're eating forbs uh, quite readily, especially the milky sap composites like the dandelion family and Chinese lettuce and other, uh, uh, they, they really like those milky sap plants. And so, you know, the upshot is it's a, it's a landscape species, it's a ground dwelling, it's a ground nesting bird and it's a ground dwelling bird. They can fly pretty well and they can fly pretty high, but they spend a lot of time on the ground walking around. So when we're talking about monitoring habitat components or evaluating, you know, that's, that's kind of a trigger to, for you to be thinking about what, what kind of things would we be monitoring? You know, shrub cover, grass cover, that sort of thing. Oh, I meant to mention in the winter, they're also dependent on, well, they're totally dependent on sagebrush cover above the snow. They, um, that's all they eat in the winter is sagebrush leaves and buds. And um, it's been, been said by one of the experts that they'll actually gain weight in the winter time as long as there's sagebrush available, which is pretty unusual for a gamer. A lot of them, winter time is a time of mortality for a lot of gamers, but sagebrush do pretty well. Um, a little more about background, so that's leading up to sort of the whys and the wherefores. So the latest thinking is that the sage grouse um, range in the western North America has contracted about 45-50% since pre-settlement times in the mid-1800s, lar um, largely due to agricultural conversion and human development and urban expansion and, um, and so forth. As you can see from the map, the, the dark blue is sort of the current uh, modeled range. What happened here? Hit the wrong button. That's interesting. Hit backwards and it goes blank. Actually, this is the next slide anyway. So, um, huh, it's weird. Anyway, so uh, on the population side of things, populations have also declined um, since we've been collecting decent data sets since the 1960s or so. The populations of sagebrush have been analyzed quite a number of several times over the last decade or two, and the graphs are all fairly similar, showing quite a you know a downward trend that started to kind of stabilize a little bit, but. Because of the, the range contraction and population declines, there were a number of petitions to list the sage grouse as an endangered species over the last uh, decade and a half or so. Um, in 2005, it was uh, the Fish and Wildlife Determ Service determined it was not warranted for ESA listing, and there was some actually issues with that whole analysis that got very political, and uh, so it was re. Uh, reassessed in 2010, and it was found to be warranted for listing um, under the Endangered Species Act, but it was uh, precluded from listing because of other priorities that Fish and Wildlife Service had at the time. Cost money and time and, you know, staff time to process the listing. So that kicked off a big effort by a state and federal agency, uh, agency in particular, private landowners, to uh, develop conservation plans that um, were more in line with promoting sagebrush conservation. And so in 2015, you know, a couple of years ago, the final ruling was that it was not warranted for listing. And then there's gonna be another evaluation the court ordered in like 2020. So with that, with that little historical background, I wanted you to kind of put, I wanted to put you in the shoes of a field office biologist, or you could be a, uh, a, a range technician or a natural resource specialist. Um, in uh, 1990, my first permanent job, you know, thank God I got my first permanent job, uh, was as a wildlife biologist in the Burley field office here in Idaho, fresh out of grad school, and um, finally, got, finally got the dream job. And Sage uh, was on the radar, it was 1990, that was before all the Endangered Species Act petitions and whatnot, but uh, there were growing concerns um, for a number of reasons, which I'll get to. Uh, there was no literature files in the office. There was, 
you know, my, I had one of those big gray metal desks and that was it. Um, we didn't even have computers yet. There was no internet, obviously. Um, there was no protocols for evaluating um, habit. There were some books out there and stuff, but in terms of like a, an agency driven process for doing that, there was um, nothing in terms of the sage grouse or uh, a couple of other species. We had protocols for monitoring uh, browse utilization and stuff like that, but we didn't have any decent vegetation maps, and we certainly obviously didn't have, you know, uh, REGAP or, or the Homer at all, US, you know, shrub map or anything like that. It was, uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty difficult. <laughs> and so given that scenario, and then still you have responsibilities as a mobile use agency as a biologist to provide comments on, you know, in a fairly short time frame on, um, a number of, number of activities ranging from uh, habitat restoration projects, realty rights away, recreation proposals, livestock grazing, energy development. Prescribed fire, I, I show up there because at the time we had a really pretty aggressive prescribed fire program in the uh, in BLM in, in some of the western states, trying to maintain um, grass seedings and, and sagebrush was kind of a four-letter word at the time and we we're kind of transitioning starting that transition toward the notion that um you know sagebrush is an important component of the landscape so um and all of that you know we had to provide input on a million or so acres um on any given on any given day so i was in a position where there, you know, there wasn't a lot to rely on for in terms of um existing protocols and, and such. So we had a, a land use plan, uh, the Casual r and which actually is still in place. Uh, it's, it's in need of, of revision. It was finalized, it was one of the, uh, well, it was the first uh, resource management plan for that part of um, the district. Uh, and like I say, it's still, it's still in effect. There were resource management objectives in the, in the land use plan uh, relative to sage grouse, it said maintain or improve, um, yada yada, 5,730 acres of sage grouse winter habitat and 1,200 acres of broodering habitat. And it referenced this generic map, and there were some lines drawn on it. And it defined broodering areas as local areas used by some species of the grouse family for nesting and raising of chicks. But I kind of begged the question of what is it that we're actually, you know, trying to provide for other than a, an area on a map. What does it mean to protect brood habitat? There were resource management objectives, which not all not all of those plans had those, but this one had some wildlife species specific objectives. Again, one of them said uh, protect meadows, seeps, and springs to provide for forbs and insects, trawl and game, uh, yada yada. And then uh, implement livestock grazing systems that will provide at least a 20 to 40% canopy cover of brush and an average plant height of 20 inches and 50% average utilization of grass understory in upland game habitat. Well, so by brush, does that mean just sagebrush or does that include bit of brush, total shrub canopy, you know, or is it, they're a little bit uh, vague in terms of how we would go about managing for habitat. And it's sort of, uh, so all of those guidelines had a, had a sagebrush management focus. Um, you know, general livestock utilization guidelines for grasses and uh, very little else. And which sort of begs the question then as I have on the bottom of the slide, what about other species composition concerns or other habitat structural characteristics that we might be interested in? There were a couple of other uh, guidelines to provide for uh, provide trouble and game habitat development in all veg manipulation projects. The second one says allow for spraying, burning, chaining, and plowing <clears throat> in raised areas, yada yada, um, where the EA process uh, that have been made through the EA process for the proper method to use that will benefit upland game. Allow for limited vegetation manipulation in areas of known sage or fruitering areas in winter areas, um, we refer to a map. 
Um, and, inter and importantly, at the bottom here is the referred to sagebrush management in Idaho wildlife hole in number nine, um, which was an Idaho Fish and Game publication at the time, which is this. And so, this is sort of like the Bible of sage grouse in Idaho. It's a very wonderful treatise on sage grouse that was written by uh, Bob Ottenreath in 1981. And um, so, out of this, out of another land use plan, we had the Twin Falls Management Framework Plan that said the guidelines developed by Fish and Game will be used, you know, to guide our habitat manipulations. Um, and then it said mobile use will aim at maintaining adequate nesting cover. Rootery needs in these areas will strive to maximize succulent forbs and insects. Um, but again, this adequate cover thing had, had, had in our land use plan wording, had a, a very heavy uh, sagebrush management focus on it. And, it, and there was not a lot uh, in there in terms of how we should manage that herbaceous component. And that's not to follow the land use plan, you know, science was evolving along with everything else there um, in those days. So, um, but that, that was the state of the art as, as I stepped into it. <coughs> okay, so I'm this newbie biologist and uh, I had some land use plan direction. There were also some, there were, there were some sage grouse guidelines aside from that Idaho Fish and Game document that were also available. Um, BLM actually in uh, 1974, Mayo Cole was his name. He wrote a, a technical note of, about habitat requirements and recommendations for sage grouse. Clay Braun from Colorado uh, wrote some guidelines in 1977 that were adopted by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency that eventually, and then they were, they were sort of amended in 1982 with some additional guidelines. Um, but all of those still had kind of a sagebrush management focus rather than more of a holistic um, ecological approach to managing, you know, plant communities and such. And again, it was driven by the fact that in the Western U.S. there was a lot of effort among the land management agencies to eradicate sagebrush. Um, I worked with some range, the Mulder range cons that um, over the years that sagebrush was like a weed, you know, and they. One, one, one fellow would get out of his truck and just like grab out a sagebrush plant with a shovel to, because uh, he'd spent, you know, his last 30 years um, trying to eradicate it. So, so that was kind of the, the climate we were um, uh, working with. So we had these, you know, relatively, in, in retrospect, the, those guidelines were only, uh, 10 or 15 years old, which um, doesn't, you know, probably isn't that long of a time frame. At the time, it seemed like they were archaic, you know, um, but it, it's what we had. So anyway, science was emerged, science started, continued to emerge relative to sagebrush science. Um, here's a snapshot out of a, out of a paper that was uh, summarizing various habitat components uh, uh, thresholds that had been reported by various researchers, and there's some of the early researchers that are up there from 1969, 1980, but uh, starting with about the fourth one down, uh, uh, Wackenden, 1990, um, Fisher, 94, Claude, 93, Aiken, 98, a number of those researchers started reporting um, from various states, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Washington, etc. Thresholds of where sagebrush canopy cover and grass heights or grass coverage were um, being selected for by, by nesting hens. And so this, this information started to, um, I guess, coalesce. And um, it seemed like in the 90s, there was a new paper coming out every, every so often and uh, building on our, building on our, uh, building the knowledge base of uh, for sage grouse conservation. So some of those findings from those uh, more recent papers were that, uh, I've got a few of them here, most nets, most uh, uh, sage grouse nests are underneath sagebrush and they have greater success if they're under sagebrush than say a, uh, 
radicrush plant. Uh, grasses at nest sites were taller and denser than at random sites. Um, grasses greater than 18 centimeters were about seven inches tall and safer stands um, had lower nest predation rates than stands with lesser grass types. Ants and beetles were important for early brood rearing. Uh, chicks were dependent on you know multiple genera or forms. A lot, a lot of good information was coming out, but <clears throat> as, a, as a land management agent biologist, they kind of beg the question for me of like whose paper do we believe? You can't just take a paper and roll it into policy. Um, we were, we could use all of this literature coming in to inform our um, project analyses under the you know, National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA um, realm, but none of this had translated into policy or protocols yet, officially. So holding that thought, you know, I mentioned all of this stuff doesn't happen um, it's not necessarily, not necessarily linear. There's a lot of things that come into play over the course of a decade that lead to a policy. So in 1995, while all this additional new research was coming in, um, <clears throat> the federal grazing regulations were uh, modified. And uh, there was, in the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, it prescribed that the standards and guidelines, standards and guidelines will be developed for an entire state or an area encompassing portions of more than one state. Standards and guidelines relative to um, rangeland health and, and grazing administration. So that kicked off a process in the western states um, where there were uh, teams set up to, to develop each state's particular standards and guides. And I think Nika might have talked about some of these when she was here a few weeks ago. So in Idaho, um, the Resource Advisory Council and associated folks that were working on these came up with uh, eight standards. Um, watersheds, you know, provide for proper infiltration, uh, riparian wetlands are at PFC, proper functioning condition, native plant communities are healthy and productive. I don't want to read through all of these. Number eight was uh, threatened and endangered plants and animals and habitats. Um, are suitable, you know, habitats are suitable to provide for viable populations. And that wasn't just T and E, that was other species of concern as well. So now we had sort of a, another uh, sort of a policy or a regulatory shift to provide for rangeland health. Um, interestingly though, and, and uh, putting us in, uh, in an awkward position as biologists was that Standards one through seven had, for the most part, had uh, pretty good protocols and um, approaches in place for evaluating those, the indicators associated with those standards. Um, but standard four, native plant communities, and standard eight, uh, native plant communities relative to providing for um, diverse and native animal habitat and population. And standard eight, um, that reads, habitats are suitable and maintain viable populations of species, there were no protocols in place for that, uh, for those two relative to evaluating animal habitat. And, you know, recognize that on a given BLM office, field office, we've got multiple, you know, dozens of hundreds of species of animals and plants we're managing for. Many of them are special status. Um, we had no, there was no standardized way for us to evaluate species. Um, to arrive at that standard eight. So each field office um, in Idaho and in other states as well started um, coming up with their own process. Uh, we, we came up with one in Burley that we figured worked for us. We had sort of a matrix of expectations, uh, like <clears throat> can't even remember what they all were, um, shrub patch size and uh, is adequate. And you know, we had some generic qualitative things like that. The adjacent field office had something different, a little bit more um, methodical, as I recall. But the end result being those different approaches were inconsistent and, and it made for some um, criticism as to whether, you know, how defensible it is. And within an agency from one office to the next, we're, we're kind of taking such a dis disparate approach. 
So we started thinking, we, you know, there's got to be a better way to at least relative to sagebrush obligates, and, and which was kind of the main species group that was eating our lunch in terms of land management. So that, you know, bear that in mind. So right around this same time also, um, and we knew this was happening in the background, uh, uh, Jack Connolly with Idaho Fish and Game was now retired, and uh, a few other authors published the Sandros, the guidelines to manage Sandros populations and their habitats. It was published in the Wildlife Society Bulletin in uh, 2000. And so it, it you know, it, it described the desired habitat characteristics of, of all of the seasonal habitats, um, lecking, nesting, summer habitat, and winter and make management recommendations relative to energy development, fence placement, um, and so forth. It, uh, it was the one document we've been waiting for that provided a synthesis of all of these uh, emerging research papers that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, merged it all into, into one place. And now that we had guidelines, we could start thinking about uh, peer reviewed published guidelines. We had something we could sink our teeth into in terms of moving forward with um, in a policy sense. So in the guidelines, it you know it broke out breeding and rooting winter habitat. It talks about sagebrush and grass forb cover um, in mesic versus arid sites. Um, it also describes the proportion of the landscape that in a given seasonal habitat that should meet those requirements. Like uh, at least 80% of the breeding nesting habitat should meet those um, guidelines. So that's that's the first time you know it took about a took several decades of research for us to get to that for science to get to that point where we had guidelines to bring forward. So a quick snapshot of what that those guidelines are then is in terms of sagebrush cover nesting habitat you know the, the desired um, threshold I guess was fifteen to twenty five percent sagebrush cover. We're now finding that there's some pretty good nest success even in 40 to 50 percent sagebrush cover areas where there's mountain mixage in eastern Idaho. Late brood, uh, your late brood rearing areas in the summer don't need, uh, they can deal with a, a little bit lower sagebrush cover. They don't, they use more of a variety of habitats. Winter, 10 to 30 percent sagebrush cover above snow, you know, so they have something to forage on. Uh, sagebrush height, we're looking at that 40 to 80 centimeter range, um, except for the winter, about 10 inches above snow. Um, again, it, it provided some guidelines for nest for grass and forb cover as well to exceed 25% uh, or so in music areas and 15% in areas like Wyoming big sagebrush sites, which isn't, you know, 15% perennial grass cover isn't a whole lot. It's not a whole lot to ask for. And there was a guideline about providing at least seven inches of perennial grass and four height in those nesting areas. So that's about when the 2000, that's when the 2000 half emerged. Um, we knew, as I said, we knew that these guidelines were coming about. We've been in conversation with the, with the authors and uh, the wildlife program lead at the time, Sidney Sather Blair uh, got, uh, several of us together, one biologist from each BLM district in Idaho, and our little team puts this initial uh, uh, preliminary half habitat assessment framework together um, for Idaho based on those um, sage-rose guidelines. Uh, again, based on the latest science, we, again, we couldn't, we, we didn't have the capacity to come up with a protocol for every species we're dealing with, so we used to have that framework, have that assessment framework to um, help us get at desired um, habitat characteristics, at least for shrub step species, assuming that sage grouse serves as a, an adequate umbrella for, for those other species like river sparrow and sage sparrow and others. <clears throat> so the goal was to use that and to help inform that standard eight for the um, standards and guides. So in that in that habitat assessment framework, that initial Idaho one, suitable habitat uh, 
we we straight straight out adopted those guidelines from Jack Conley and others. But from a management perspective, we thought those guidelines themselves were a little bit too black and white. You know, seven inches or beyond was considered productive um, grass height for say grouse, for example. Um, but from a, a land management perspective, we thought it would be helpful to have a uh, a gradient or a, or a choice of habitat quality bins, bins as I call it here for, for management applications. And that way, you know, it's not black and white, like good or bad habitat. We could, we could rate the uh, habitat um, in more of a, um, along a continuum. Those marginal, so we added a marginal and unsuitable categories uh, based on just expert opinion and uh, we did work with the authors of the uh, Conley guidelines and uh, we got some feedback on that. So yeah, this initial cut was the initial half, uh, which is very similar to the current half. Um, looked at these various indicators uh, from the guidelines and then we create, you know, we again put them in those uh, three bins, suitable, marginal, or unsuitable. So for nesting cover, uh, looking at the top, your big sagebrush cover was uh, 15 to 25% for um, in suitable habitat. Marginal, we defined it as 10 to 14 or 26 to 35. It was just uh, sort of a middle of the road decision. And then unsuitable habitat, we defined as greater or less than 10% or greater than 35. And as I said a minute ago, the, that that greater than 35, that's now coming under, um, we're having to revise those upper boundaries a little bit. And that'll probably happen in the next version of the half one of these days. Um, sagebrush height, uh, suitable was 15 to 30 inches and unsuitable less than 10 inches, for example. Um, we added, we did add one um, uh, indicator here that did not occur in the sagebrush guidelines and that was big sagebrush growth form. And this was a sort of a recommendation from the, a steel biologist where we were encountering areas where uh, there were a predominance of basin big sage um, that has that columnar growth form, it's almost like a tree. So even though you might have 20% sagebrush cover, it's not providing a lot of cover at that ground level for a nesting hen. And so we uh, qualitatively had folks capture what the predominant big, uh, sagebrush growth form was, whether it was spreading, um, which is good, or, or predominantly columnar, uh, which was not so good. Um, and again, other indicators, we, we adopted the seven inches or greater uh, perennial grass height as suitable, and then five to seven inches or so was marginal and then less than five inches of those suitable. And so the idea was then when you were evaluating a plot was to look at all of those indicators together and make a make a call as to um, well whether each indicator was marginal, suitable, or unsuitable, but then you'd look at those collectively to describe the plot and not base that call on on any one indicator. That makes sense. So fast forwarding a little bit. Actually, a lot. So that 2000 half <clears throat> that helped us to inform our land health evaluations from 2000 through about uh, actually through about 2010 or 12 in a lot of offices. But right around 2004 uh, or five, the uh, WAF was a Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies recognized the need to develop a, a multi-scale habitat framework. Um, oh, and actually a couple of states sort of adopted the, the Idaho half. Nevada had a version of it and Montana kind of adopted it in Wyoming. Um, but uh, anyway, WAPO identified that need for a multi-scale half. Remember I mentioned earlier that sagebrush are a, a landscape scale species that they use habitats at different scales. Um, so there was a, a, an effort to create this multi-scale app. Uh, an initial draft was released in 2010, sort of informally by BLM. 
and then uh, and then we refined it and did some testing, and then uh, the final version was released in 2015 as and released as its technical reference uh, that we've been implementing since then. So just a little bit on the on the field approaches, uh, diverting a little bit here. So I mean, initially for cover that uh, earlier, actually even in the current half, there's an option there to collect cover by line point intercept as well as um, using Dovenmeyer frames uh, for sagebrush, grass, and form, cover, and, and height, and whatever. Oh, and then height was uh, measured uh, based on those plants that are hit with an LPI pin or, or a corner of a Dovenmeyer frame. Um, since 2015, we've done a policy shift in BLM nationally transitioning to the AIM principle that I'm sure uh, Jason has talked about, right? You talked about AIM yeah. some. Yeah. Um, partly the, the rationale being so we don't have a whole separate process for sage grouse that's, you know, substantially different from what we're using for other rangeland monitoring. And then there was a whole course of discussion and debate that kind of went into that decision, but um, we've kind of made the transition in BLM now to collect our this habitat data using the, the AIM core indicators methods uh, um, to inform those uh, indicators for the habitat assessment. So it's, uh, so we're not using the Dobbenmeyer frames anymore within, uh, within the BLM applications of the HAP, even though some other agencies or entities uh, still prefer using double minor frames. Within BLM, we're using LPI. Uh, we've moved to a standardized plot configurations. Uh, the focus in the half was doing a single transect in many places on the landscape on you know, random plots. Um, we, we've adopted, um, for the most part, those uh, sort of a Y-shaped 30 meter plot configuration uh, using the aim uh, uh, or monitoring manual approach uh, for consistency and to get better data at that particular plot, you know, to reduce variability. Um, we modified the height protocol at, uh, in the half, we talked about measuring plant height based on where the line point intercept, um, you know, hits a plant. Um, we've adopted the AIM approach again, just for consistency with other data BLM is collecting, you know, where we're measuring the height of a height of a plant part that occurs within that, what is it, a 15 millimeter, 15 millimeter, 15 centimeter diameter cylinder, imaginary cylinder that's tangent to the tape. So, and, that, and again, that's an effort to just get our sage grouse and habitat protocols in line with everything else we're doing with range monitoring uh, relative to aim. We've also adopted a consistent, you know, stratified random spatially balanced approach to those plots back in the day with the early half we took more of a approach of finding um representative areas you know you'd walk out into a sagebrush patch and then maybe take a random compass azimuth or something for your transect uh, we still have some inherent bias and so we, we switched to this you know gis based uh, uh Spatially balanced approach for selecting plot location. That's induced a lot more rigor into our, into our process. There's also rigorous training and calibration of crews involved with uh, implementing HAP right now. And again, in um, building on the AIM training that we have around the, the West every year. We've got district, state, and national level data management. Um, and so it, it's, you know, we've really, really uh, evolved over the last few years into a, a, a more rigorous approach with the habitat framework. And um, I think the authors had initially even envisioned a, a few years ago. So I'm going to continue on with this multi scale cons. Any questions up until now? Because I'm going to, right now, I'm going to talk about how it all fits together in terms of this multi scale. Uh, Stuff. So putting it all together then, I'm going to call this Sage Grouse 102. So this 
foundational to this whole habitat assessment framework process then with this notion that sage rose occupy habitats at multiple scales. And I didn't, I didn't want to dive into this first, but I wanted to talk about that whole evolution and, um, of, of how some of this came about first. But the notion that uh, that was first, uh, I guess, proposed by Johnson in 1980 in a paper in Ecology where habitat selection occurs at basically four scales, the broad, mid, fine, and site. So broad scale is the first order. Uh, that's uh, the range of the speed. Actually, let me go backward. So at the site scale, we're talking about uh, seasonal habitats of, of a particular species. In the case of sage grouse, we'll focus on that. So nesting habitat occurs you know, in, under a sagebrush plant in, in a patch of sagebrush. And that in turn, that nesting habitat occurs within a home range, uh, which is the third order, which again, is nested within a, a population or a meta population, which is nested within the range of the species. So looking at these sort of uh, linearly, I guess, broad scale is the, the range wide extent of the species, mid scale, we're looking at sort of the population scale that might be in the order of several hundred thousand acres. Uh, where we're looking, and we're looking at the uh, capability of dispersal of, of animals within or between the population. At the fine scale, we're looking at the individual home ranges, like of a local sage grouse population, if you will, like, um, I don't know, there's a, a weezer, the weezer population down in south, in western Idaho, or uh, the Shishon Basin population near Jackpot. And then at the site scale, we we're looking at those individual seasonal habitats, like nesting, <coughs> summer, winter. And so for those, for mid, fine, and site, we rate those as suitable, marginal, or unsuitable based on a separate suite of indicators for each one. Um, the site scale information is largely driven by field data, like the AU plot data. The other scales are uh, evaluated, like it's largely a geospatial exercise based on um, land cover and anthropogenic data sets that we compile. Anthropogenic meaning um, power lines and highways and energy development and things of that nature. So at the, again, at the broad scale, we're talking about the range of the species and it, uh, <coughs> it's not evaluating any indicators here, it's just, it's, but it does set the bound of, for the delineation of the, of the mid scale. Uh, at the mid scale, uh, the initial vision was that we would use these um, populations that were developed by the uh, <coughs> Western Association of uh, Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, in the well, mid 2000s. Um, but as we got to implementing the, that 2015 half, it, it got kind of problematic as to uh, like comparing this mid scale with that mid scale uh, in terms of a population quote unquote. So uh, our Scientists at, uh, in Denver, BLM scientists um, and others, we, we got some of the half authors on board as well, decided we needed a, a different approach rather than using these population polygons for the mid scale. Um, so we had some discussions and conference calls in 2017 um, and developed a consensus approach for delineating those mid scale areas. And so, for example, in Idaho, we used we worked closely with Idaho Fish and Game in using available sage grouse telemetry points, uh, did a movement analysis, and kind of broke, <clears throat> uh, it overlaid that on top. These colored zones are uh, sage grouse habitat management um, areas that we, we identified in our latest land use plan in 2015. I, I won't go into that right now. But well, we use telemetry to sort of refine uh, these mid-scale areas, uh, refine it a little further with uh, uh, fifth and sixth field hucks. Um, you know, so our, our boundaries of these polygons weren't just um, arbitrary. Use nape imagery and other other uh, features like major rivers and roads, and so we came up with a set of polygons that define these mid-scale areas. Similar efforts were done in other states 
uh, that were coordinated through our, our Denver office. Um, so that uh, to come up with this latest uh, map of mid scale. And so mid, have indicators for the mid scale are we're looking at um, like acres of occupied and unoccupied habitat in, in kind of a broad scale, patch size and number. We, we have a whole definition of patch size and I won't go into that, nuts and bolts of that. We're looking at patch connectivity, linkage, landscape matrix, uh, whether whether the habitat between those various patches is, um, you know, a threat to sagebrush or not, for example, a woodland or a <coughs> versus, uh, say, um, dry land agriculture. You know, it kind of categorizes that matrix of, of habitat between the patches. And we also quantify androgenic disturbance. So suitable habitat was defined as con connected mosaics of sagebrush allow dispersal and, migra and migration within populations, and anthropogenic factors are not widespread. And then marginal and unsuitable are, you know, step down from that. And so there's a number of geospatial data sets that go into that, and ultimately you make a call as to whether, uh, again, that, that mid-scale polygon is, uh, is marginal, suitable, or unsuitable. Suitable, marginal, or unsuitable. Um, Taking, looking at sort of a preponderance of evidence approach and not letting one indicator necessarily drive the drive the call. So at the, then we step down to the fine scale, which is the home range uh, sort of scale. And so again, we looked at uh, VHF and GPS telemetry of sage grouse. We had tens of thousands of uh, telemetry points within Idaho due to a number of uh, masters and PhD dissertations and other um, monitoring that's been going on the last decade or two, and there was a whole rule set as far as which points we decided to use. We looked at occupied lakes and uh, and then looked at grouping these various telemetry clusters based on highways and topographic barriers, and it just what seemed to make sense. Is what what were the birds telling us? Um, we did a we kind of refined that further with a sort of a minimum convex polygon analysis of those clusters of points and uh, refined it further again with um, our habitat designations from our recent land use plan uh, planning effort incorporated that all into a, a and then we smoothed out some of these boundaries for example initially the convex polygon kind of missed some of what we know is habitat right here so we made sure that those fine scale polygons grabbed all the habitat in that surrounding area. Um, and so the end result was this map of our fine scale areas in Idaho. I think we have 27 uh, in Idaho, sort of individual population areas. All the other Western states with sagebrush have done the same thing. So then they, there's indicators to uh, Look to evaluate those fine scale areas as well. Um, acres of occupied habitat, anthropogenic disturbance, and so on. Number of data sets. Again, we're making an effort to classify each of those fine scale areas as suitable, unsuitable, or marginal. We're, we've got a couple more minutes here. To, um, so, anyway, it's, it's within those fine scale areas then, that we're doing these site scale evaluation that we talked about earlier where we're looking at evaluating nesting habitat quality, root habitat, winter habitat using um, those aim, aim principles. I think we better wrap up. Um, that's a lot of that kind of like drinking out of a fire hose. But um, I guess we'll, if we have a minute or two for a Question and we'll wrap it up there before we run out. Um, so I was wondering, like you mentioned a little bit about um, the process of like the potter and the evidence and things, but I'm wondering, like, when you have that fine scale like site data, how do you kind of roll that up to look at biggest, like the broader scales? Is that is that done kind of as like a a process with a bunch of people, is it kind of quantitative or abstract? 
interested in that. Well, we rolled it up in, in, in the, what we call a, uh, uh, a summary report where, and, and this is sort of these evaluations are happening sort of incrementally across the state. We, we just don't have the capacity to do them all at once. And so in a given field office, for example, we might be looking at a grazing allotment or a, or a watershed where we, we're having to evaluate range on health standards. And so we'll, at that site scale, and so we'll, we'll get that done and then run the, the relevant fine scale analysis, geospatial analysis for that. And then the mid scales uh, are being sort of done independently. And so all of these various scale results then are being rolled into a, a summary report that, um, so it describes the mid scale suitability, the fine scale suitability, and then the site scale. Um, that helps. Yeah. And then those data are also being rolled up into national you know, data sets, state, state data sets as well. Right. Again, some of this is evolving as we speak and, and building on, um, I think each time we do one of these things, we, we learn something new. So it's kind of a work in progress. Other questions from Paul?